listening to Everlasting Ministries, equipping Christians through media. Get ready as we dive into the Word with my husband, Pastor Eric Ureen, as he preaches from Riverside Christian Church in Roseville, California. Lord, I pray that every ear, including my ears, will be open to the receiving of your word tonight, God. Lord, I pray as King Solomon prayed that we would have a heart, a listening heart, Lord, for we desire that every one of us will always leave here drawn closer to you. Please use me, Lord. I can't do this on my own giftings, God. I want it done in your will, Jesus. Amen. I want to focus on a sermon series that deals with the reality of human emotions. And so as I was thinking about that, uh, I'm, I was reminded of some of those TV shows in the 90s, and I think some of them still go, go on today. Uh, I consulted someone very close to me who I considered an authority in this area of TV programming um, regarding the Jerry Springer show and Mari Povich. Because those shows, I mean, how, how many of you have ever seen any of those shows? I've seen one or two episodes. So, right, every one of them is dealing with human emotions to an extreme, right? Anger, love, so-and-so cheated on so-and-so. Those are, those are all emotions that we deal with. And as I looked into it, I, I kind of broke it down to four parts. One would be envy and jealousy, Another would be the need for us to control our mouths. Another one would be conflict resolution. How do we do that as Christians? And the one I'm going to speak about today is resolving anger. We all deal with anger at moments in our life. Some of us may be dealing with some anger right now. So I want to probe into seeing what the Bible has to say, how we as Christians deal with with anger, anger in the present, anger in our past, that still dwells within us in some way. What is anger? Psalm 73, 21 and 22 says, When my heart was filled with bitterness and my mind was seized with envy, I was stupid and I did not understand. I was like a dumb animal in the presence of God. I don't know about you, but I have definitely have had those moments In my life, looking at that, another interpretation of the seizing of the mind is that it's like a piercing from a fang from a poisonous snake. And in the Hebrew there, it's actually the adder, which is a poisonous snake that exists in that part of the Middle East, that injects its poison directly into the human heart. That's a very powerful statement. When bitterness and anger are allowed... It will take control of our mind. And the consequence of that is stupidity and senselessness. Breaking that down, it means being incapable of sensation or comprehension, that which is associated with a dumb animal. So not knowing too much about animals, I figured, hey, go on Google and find out what the top three dumb animals are considered. So we have visual reference. And... This was, yeah, I thought she was the one that came to my mind. Actually, that did not come up as one of the top three. Number one was a cockapoo. Anybody know what a cockapoo is? It's like a, kind of like a parrot, kind of a bird. But it can't fly. And one of the interesting things about a cockapoo, when it gets scared, it freezes and it won't move. Or it will climb a tree. And then when it gets to the top of the tree... It'll jump off the tree as if it could fly, but it can't, and it'll just boom, fall straight down to the ground. You can, get, you can go on YouTube and watch some of these videos. They're pretty funny. But. So that was, that was considered number one. Number two was a turkey. They are so dumb that they could drown in the rain. I've heard that many times. Number three, this one shocked me, but number three was pandas. Yeah, cute, cuddly looking, but apparently... Pandas were carnivores, and because of the changing environment around them, they've moved from eating meat to primarily eating bamboo, so they are perpetually malnutritioned. 
And of course, there's that famous Disney movie about a uh, panda that does kung fu, who is always clumsy and dorky and, and stupid, right? None of us here want to end up being like one of those dumb animals. So dealing with anger, I want to paint a picture for you. I'm sure at some time in your life you've seen uh, that famous trick where there's a bed of hot coals and somebody walks across the coals, right, and it doesn't burn their feet. But one of the mysteries to keeping that trick is that they are constantly moving. Their feet never stay stationary in one spot that the soles of their feet burn. Dealing with anger in our lives is no different. The longer it remains in our heart, the more painful it is for us and others around us in our lives. Unresolved anger will produce bitterness, and bitterness is like that bed of hot, fiery coals that will continue to burn deep wounds into our soul, sear our heart, and contaminate our spirit. The eventual result is our relationships will turn to ash. There is a thief, and the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We know that. But the thief will also come to steal our emotions away. Emotions of joy, peace, love. He wants to take those things from our heart. He comes to rob us of our mind as well. Just as we read there in Scripture, and we will go further later on. Let us look at Scripture now. All the scripture I'll be reading is pulled in context, dealing with the issue of resolving anger of the past and of the present. Going through scripture, found that there are eight key points to dealing with anger. I thought that was kind of cool because the number eight in the Bible signifies resurrection and restoration, which is one of the promises of dealing with anger, unresolved anger. Resurrection and regeneration. So let's look at these eight points. Number one, we need to put past anger away. It needs to be dealt with and it needs to be let go. Psalm 38, 18, I confess my guilt. My sin troubles me. Ask God to reveal unresolved anger in your life. Ask God to see the sin as he sees the sin. Sometimes it's difficult. We can do things and we may not think, oh, that's okay, or maybe that's a light sin. But we need to be able to see sin as God sees it, to be able to recognize it and identify it so it can be resolved. And we need to confess to God all anger kept in the heart that is sin and confess to wise counsel. We might have a good friend or a pastor, but it's important if these things are gripping you and you're having difficulty to get rid of it, find wise counsel to talk to and tell them about it, or a good friend that you can trust. Number two, we need to look at the root. A lot of times in deliverance ministry, right, to get healing, you've got to go to the root so that weed doesn't grow back. Psalm 139, 23 and 24, Examine me, O God, and know my mind. Test me and know my thoughts. See whether I am on an evil path. Then lead me on the everlasting path. Amen? Amen? Do you feel rejected, hurt, ignored, or rejected by betrayal? Do you feel cheated, attacked, or wronged? Did you feel threatened, out of control, powerless, or fearful? Did you feel inferior, hindered, or controlled? Those are all things that can be at the root of an anger issue. Identify. What is it? Number three, let go of the right to be offended. There are a lot of times we get offended. Somebody does something to us that creates anger. And we have, in the world's terms, a right to do something about it. But we don't have a right to be offended. Proverbs 17.9, in regards to being a fool or being made out to look like a fool. It says, Whoever forgives an offense seeks love, but whoever keeps bringing up the issue separates the closest of friends. Let go of the right to dwell on being offended. 
Let go of the right to hold on to an offense. Let go of the right to hear, I am sorry from the other person who offended you. And let go of the right to keep bringing it up. Number four, we must forgive. We must forgive, very important. Under the direction to live as God's people, in Colossians 3.13 it says, Put up with each other and forgive each other if anyone has a complaint. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. That means we must release our hurts to God. We must pray for the one that hurt us. We must give our desires for revenge over to God. We must release the people that hurt us over to God as well. Sometimes we think, oh, I can control them in my own ways and manipulate them and get them to change. No, we're supposed to give them up to God and let God deal with them. And sometimes if we're to remain in their life, the Lord will direct us so we can be there. But ultimately, God is the one that needs to deal with them. He may choose you as, an, as a vessel, and he may choose someone else as a vessel. But we have to be able to release them. And number five, this one's hard. We spoke about this a while back. Rejoice in the purpose of pain. There's a lot of us going through pain in this room. Sometimes physical pain can be a manifestation of emotional pains or woundings. Sometimes it's just the world we live in and things just happen, right? But we need to rejoice in the pain either way. As an instruction to Christians, Peter says in 1 Peter 5.10, God who shows you his kindness and grace, who has called you through Christ Jesus to his eternal glory, will restore you, strengthen you, make you strong, and support you as you suffer for a little while. Thank God for the promises because the trials are for our own good. Thank God that he will use this process for the good of others as well. So it's not only for us. Others around us will also benefit from us going through and persevering through those trials. And then Thank God that there is restoration after the suffering. That is a promise. Now, when's that restoration going to come after the suffering? The one thing for certain is when we die and we're in eternity with Jesus Christ. That is the certainty. Will it come before that point? Ask the Lord. And thank God that the pain will make you strong, firm, and steadfast. I know times in my life, when I've had to go through physical pain. I always think about this one time where I had to deliver a sermon. My back was in a lot of pain. That required me to lean on the Lord more and less on my own physical capabilities. And as a result, I think that was probably one of the most powerful outreaches that I was ever able to participate in because I really was forced <laughs> to be in a position to truly rely on God for strength, but we need to thank God for his purpose of pain. Rejoice. Rejoice in that. That's a difficult one. A lot of people don't want to talk about it, but it's true. It's in the word. And number six, bring back the relationships when appropriate. Example for not bringing back a reconciliation with a relationship would be someone who is unrepentant, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. Someone who's abuser, that's a physical abuser, verbal abuser, and inappropriate relationships. Obviously, two people that are married and fornicating shouldn't get back together after they reconcile that situation. So, those are the exemptions. And these, this are the words of Jesus Christ talking about anger here. But I can guarantee, which means without a cause, that whoever is angry with one another believer will answer for it in court. Whoever calls another believer an insulting name will answer for it in the highest court. Whoever calls another believer a fool will answer for it in hell fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that another believer has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. First, go away and make peace with that person. 
Then come back and offer your gift. That's Matthew 5, 22 through 24. So if there's an offense, God is saying you need to deal with that before coming or approaching the altar to give him an offering. We need to confess our anger to God and also to the person. Now when we do that, we need to do that with carefully chosen words, right? If we're looking to reconcile a relationship with someone who has offended us or hurt us in some way, if we approach them to reconcile, we need to do that with carefully chosen words. We need to stay clear of accusations. We need to stay clear of blame when confessing to the other individual. We need to make our intentions known that we wish to keep and rebuild the relationship. Sometimes we can assume things in another individual. If I say this or if I act this way, this person is just going to assume that, oh, we're just back together and the relationship is mended. No, we need to articulate our intentions that, hey, look, I am intending to rebuild and keep this relationship. Number seven, we need to be a recipient of God's love. Paul's prayer for God to strengthen Christians is seen in Ephesians 3, 17 and 19. Then Christ will live in you through faith. I also pray that love may be the ground into which you sink your roots and on which you have your foundation. This way, with all of God's people, you will be able to understand how wide, long, high, and deep His love is. You will know Christ's love, which goes far beyond any knowledge. I am praying this so that you may be completely filled with God. And again, that's Ephesians 3, 17 and 19. We need to remember to read our Bible verses that reveal God's love for us. And we need to meditate on that daily. That's important, especially for some of us that struggle with feeling loved by God. We need to see it. We need to hear it. Sometimes listening to audio um, recordings of the Bible can help you in that way if you're more of an auditory than a visual learner. But either way, you need to immerse yourself in the promises of the Word of God for His love and compassion that He has for you. I also need to let the Lord meet all of our needs for love. Our significance is expressed in His love for us through the actions that He has taken, will take, and the written expressions in the Word of God. And we need to thank God daily for His love. And that's something I don't do nearly enough. I was really convicted with that today. In fact, I don't remember the last time I even thanked God for that. So even when I was going through the sermon, I just had to sit back and say, Lord, thank you for loving me. Sometimes we can walk in it, but we never verbally express it and tell him how much we are thankful for his love. And then number eight, be a giver of the love of Jesus Christ. In the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, We read in John 13, 34, and 35, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Everyone will know that you are my disciples because of your love for each other. We need to remember to pray for everyone that has hurt us. Just as Jesus prayed for those who hurt him and continues to pray for all of us. Now, we need to pray to the Lord, asking Him. Ask the Lord even now. I want you to, if, as you agree with these, ask the Lord quietly in your spirit. Ask Him right now that, Lord, my heart be your heart. Lord, that my mind will be your mind, that my will will be your will. And may my love be a reflection of you, Jesus Christ, and the world around me. Amen. Amen. It's important that we get this as believers. Forgiveness is mandatory as a Christian, but reconciliation is the optional second step. We should always be in a place to forgive. But when it comes to reconciling with another individual, 
and bringing them back into your circle, that's optional based on qualifications. So let's look at the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. I think sometimes this, this will help us to differentiate the two. Forgiveness focuses on the offense, and reconciliation focuses on the relationship. Forgiveness doesn't require a relationship. Reconciliation requires a relationship. Forgiveness can be given by one person. Reconciliation requires at least two people. Forgiveness releases the offender. Reconciliation rejoins with the offender. Forgiveness is extended in one direction, and reconciliation is reciprocal. Right? Goes in a circle between the two. Forgiveness involves a changing of the mind towards the offender. Reconciliation requires a changing of behavior by the offender. Forgiveness is a free gift given one way. Reconciliation is the restoration of a relationship. Forgiveness is given even when it's not earned, but reconciliation is given because the offender is earning it. Forgiveness is unconditional. Reconciliation is based on repentance. And as we look back in the word a couple of weeks ago, the word there for repentance in the Greek means a changing of the mind. You can't reconcile with someone who doesn't change. But the changing of the mind will always result in the changing of someone's actions. That's what we can see. That's the fruit that they bear. Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. Do not be a friend with one who has bad temper and never keep company with a hothead or you will learn his ways and set a trap for yourself. Again, that's Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. The Hebrew word there says, do not even associate with one who has a bad temper or go along with, which means to come in agreement with, a hot-tempered man. And what is the outcome? we choose to do that, we will learn their ways and it will end up us setting a trap for ourselves. Now there's enough traps in life. They said the devil's always trying to put traps. I'm like, whenever you have the opportunity to avoid or reduce the number of traps in life, take it. Because there's always going to be something to deal with, right? So when we have the opportunity to avoid something or to keep it from coming into our life, take it. A hot-tempered man, that means the result is a dumb animal. And as cute as a panda bear is, we were not created to be a panda bear. So wrapping this up, I want to go back to Psalm 73, 21 through 24. When my heart was filled with bitterness and my mind was seized with envy, I was stupid and I did not understand. I was like a dumb animal in your presence. But then the second part. Yet I am always with you. You hold on to my right hand. With your advice, you guide me. And in the end, you will take me to glory. Amen? Did this speak to anyone in this room? I look at my wife, she looks at me, different parts. <laughs> yep, it's, it's speaking, it's moving. It's important for us to, to deal with this. We have to forgive. We can't hold on to anger and bitterness. And when possible, reconcile. It's hard, but it's essential for the Christian life. <laughs>